from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 40, recorded on June 29th, 2024. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to take a closer look at Paul's column, Lab Leak Mania. Why did the New York Times publish an op-ed supporting the lab leak theory? So I want to ask you, Paul, what was your reaction when you saw this column in the New York Times? Anger. Anger. Yeah. This is the same reaction I had when I watched uh, Dr. Fauci testify in front of a congressional, congressional subcommittee on June the 3rd. Uh, the, this is an important issue, a, a very important issue. I mean, you have um, a, this is the third pandemic coronavirus in the last 20 years. I think it's safe to assume there'll be another one. And so it's very important to understand the origin of this virus. And I think we do understand it. And, and so I think with that understanding, we have to be able to try and prevent or at least much more quickly respond to the next one. The lab leak theory is just nonsense. It's a complete waste of time and money, but time that should be spent really trying to figure out how to prevent the next animal to human spill over event. You make the statement in the article that two-thirds of the U.S. believe that the pandemic began in a lab. That's amazing, isn't it? Although understandable. I mean, it's much easier to understand that there is an evil force working behind the scenes, some evil scientist who, you know, is working to create this this virus and to, le you know, to then leak it out to the world to do all this harm. It's much easier to understand that than the sort of the mechanics behind going some, from bat to an intermediate host to a, to a human and how that would occur, even though that's how it occurs. That's how pretty much 70 percent of the pathogens that infect humans occur or invariably have their source in animals. Personally, I think it's an indictment of science education in the U.S. I think people just don't understand it. And as, as you say, they look for the simple uh, explanations that they get from movies, for example. Exactly. I agree. I think we should, the, the, the people who have done all the, the work showing that this clearly was an animal to human spillover event should be out there more, although I think they try. It's just uh, hard. It's, I think it's much easier to be in the misinformation business than the information business. So Chan writes in, in the opinion piece that data suggests that the pandemic most likely occurred because virus escaped from a research lab in Wuhan, China. Why is this a misleading statement? Well, to, to, in order to buy um, Dr. Chan's argument, she's a molecular biologist at the Broad Institute in Boston, you have to believe the following series of events. You have to believe, one, that the, the U.S. funded research, um, specifically gain-of-function research, whereby um, a coronavirus would gain function to, to cause a pandemic. Um, and while the, the U.S. did, through Echo Health, fund um, uh, Xi Zhang Li at, uh, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, she didn't do any research that showed that there was a gain of function. You then had to believe that she had a precursor virus, something similar to SARS-CoV-2, that she then modified to become SARS-CoV-2. But the viruses that she worked with, so-called WIV-1 or R2TG13, were not precursor viruses. You then have to believe that she took this, this precursor virus, for which we have no evidence, and then modified it to become a, uh, a virulent SARS-CoV-2 virus, which then infected a, a lab researcher who then traveled nine miles crossing the Yangtze River to the southwestern section of the Hunan wholesale seafood market, um, where animals susceptible to this virus existed exactly where an animal to human spillover event would occur and then started a super spreader event when that person could have gone to any of 10,000 places in Wuhan. And there's two different lineages of SARS-CoV-2. So there had to be two human super spreaders that then went to that area exactly where you would expect an animal to human spillover event to occur. There, there's a line in uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland where the Red Queen says, sometimes I believe six impossible things before breakfast. That's mm. what this was. All right, so in the, in the opinion piece, she makes five 
points. Let's go over them briefly. You do that in your article. First of all, she, she writes that spillovers are from bats are rare, which, by the way, this wasn't a spillover from bats into humans. It just it seems to ignore that. Neither was CoV-1. But well, why is that wrong? Right. There was actually a paper that was published um, by uh, Shi Jiang Li, actually. It was the senior author, um, looking at people that lived in rural China who had not been exposed to SARS-1. But they live in fairly close association with bats that found that roughly 2.7 percent or one in 40 uh, people who were in that environment had evidence of being infected with bat coronaviruses. So presumably through an intermediate host, but um, not rare at all. So that's wrong. She also writes, this is part of uh, point number two, the Wuhan lab was making coronaviruses more dangerous for humans. You know, that that is, um, first of all, an irresponsible thing to say. What she's arguing for is that people created this pandemic. And, and I think, you know, to tarnish the reputation then of people who work seriously on this virus um, is, uh, I think, an, a completely irresponsible thing to do. The Wuhan Institute of Virology is in Wuhan studying viruses because it's a major metropolitan center. It's the kind of place where a, a pandemic virus might occur. That's why it's there, to study that, not to create it. And I think that um, if you're going to make a statement like that, that here are people who created a virus, you have to have a little more evidence than just innuendo, false statements, and conspiracy theories. She also writes that um, it's unclear if the Wuhan Institute of Virology had a precursor to SARS-CoV-2. It's clear that they didn't. I mean, we know the viruses that they were working with, and, and this has been investigated also by uh, U.S. intelligence committees, who you also have to believe are just all part of this conspiracy, right? I mean, you have to, again, believe that this is a massive conspiracy involving everybody to hide the truth, and um, they weren't working with that precursor virus. WIV-1 and RTG-13 were not precursor viruses to SARS-CoV-2. She also makes the claim that there was an outbreak of COVID in workers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Well, again, there were workers that got sick in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, just, just as there were workers who got sick pretty much in every laboratory in this country in winter months, because that's when winter respiratory viruses occur, like influenza or parainfluenza, or respiratory syncytial virus, or human metanuma virus. So when those researchers were tested, there wasn't any evidence that they had SARS-CoV-2, again, something that was looked at by U.S. Intelligence Committee. So again, a false and misleading statement. Yeah, so makes a point of saying that they used biosafety level two conditions and, and that led to the leakage. Right. So, so so-called biosafety levels one through four it, it describe uh, various levels of protective equipment or sort of engineering concepts just to reduce uh, uh, transmission of the virus or spread of the virus or leak of the virus outside of a lab. And BSL-2, which is what they use, is adequate for SARS-CoV-2. And it's adequate for measles, which is um, a virus that is far more contagious than this virus. I and mean, measles has a so-called reproducibility index or transmissibility index of around 18, whereas this virus is in the sort of two to four range. So again, a false and misleading statement. This is one of my favorites. She writes, a spillover at the market is not supported by strong evidence. Oh my gosh. What more evidence do you need? You have this definitive paper, as far as I'm concerned, by Michael Warby and, and, and uh, Chris Anderson and Marion Krupmans and uh, Robert Gary and um, Eddie Holmes that, that, that did an extensive analysis where you see this, this, this is the, the first few cases occurred right where you would expect an animal to human spillover event occur. And then it occurred concentrically, uh, concentrically uh, away from that original uh, source. And, and if you look at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, it's, there, there are no cases there initially. They're all exactly where you would expect this to be. So in addition, you know, the, the problem in part was um, when SARS-1 broke out in Foshan, uh, Guangdong province in 2002, they didn't initially kill the animals. So, so you knew that there was an event that had occurred. You had the animals that were available for testing. Here, um, what the Chinese government did, because they realized this was the epicenter of this outbreak, is they went in and disinfected the area and slaughtered most of those animals, so they weren't there to be tested. But what was there to be tested was the um, cages and uh, the equipment used to brush the animals or kill the animals 
and the carts that were used uh, to house the animals, that was there. And when you went back and you looked to see whether there was any evidence of genetic, genetic evidence of SARS-CoV-2, it was there. And in addition, although you didn't have the animals there anymore, you did have evidence of mammalian DNA consistent with bamboo rats, palm civets, raccoon dogs, all animals that are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. It is about as definitive as you can get to answer that question. The way I look at it, Paul, is the lab leakers basically pick at these papers because they are devastating to the lab leak hypothesis. So they just try to find little things, and, and she writes this nonsense in this opinion, and people buy it. But in fact, those papers are solid, and they've been criticized, and the authors have responded, and they are devastating to the lab leak hypothesis. Right, and this gets to your earlier point. So, so when that paper came out, which was in 2022 in, in the journal Science, maybe we have to do a better job of putting that out there immediately and saying to people, look, this is the answer you're looking for. This, this tells us how this happened. And now we have to do the hard work of figuring out how to prevent or at least much more quickly respond to the next one instead of diverting ourselves to this dead end, fruitless hypothesis. All right. So two more points she makes. One is that we have never found a single infected animal at the market. <laughs> True. That's because they were all killed. So, uh, and again, that that I think really was uh, Dr. Chan's most disingenuous comment. I think she knows that. I think she knows that those animals weren't available. So to say that they weren't tested, I think is really disingenuous. And finally, she says the Chinese have not searched very hard for SARS-CoV-2 infected animals. Yeah, <laughs> they, you know, they killed them. I, I, I do think, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to, to do the right thing here, which is we know that this is now the second episode in China where a human animal to, uh, and I'm sorry, animal to human spillover event occurs. We know that they, they sell animals illegally. They sell, there's about 31 different species of mammals that they're selling illegally. The, the, we can't allow this to happen. I mean, I just think that there has to be an international team of health professionals and, and um, scientists who are able to uh, very quickly respond to these kinds of situations, or better yet, try and make it so that we don't uh, have this kind of event occur again, instead of talking endlessly about lab leaks. It's just, uh, it's us not doing our job. Paul, do you understand what her agenda is and why she is doing this? Because as you said earlier, she must know that some of the statements she makes are not correct. I think she believes it. I mean, I think if you gave Alina Chan a lie detector test, I think she would pass it. I mean, mm -hmm. she's certainly um, a vigorous advocate for this position. She wrote a book called Viral, Search for the Origin of, of COVID-19, which she wrote with Matt Ridley, who interestingly is a climate change denier. But so she writes this book and, <laughs> and so she's, you know, takes a lot of work to write a book. I think, you know, it takes a lot of work to write an op-ed piece like she wrote. And I think, I think she believes it and that's fine. I, I think that there are, it's interesting to me that there are a lot of people who are in many ways brilliant scientists who become conspiracy theorists. Even the brightest of scientists are not uh, immune to being conspiracy theorists. And I think that's what's going on with her. What, what bothers me actually is not that she writes a book because anybody can publish a book or that she submits an op-ed. It bothers me that the New York Times publishes that. I, I, I think that they really have to vet that through experts like Michael Warby or you before they, they put that kind of uh, op-ed out there. And then they follow it up with another op-ed that was written by a science journalist that basically was equivocal, saying, well, it could be lab leak, it could be animal to human spillover event. Let Michael Warby write the, these, these op-eds, or at least review them. I, I just, you know, this all the news that's fit to print should be changed to all the news that's fit to print or not. Yeah, that was going to be my last question, is why would the Times publishers... I, I don't know what their vetting system is. It, I, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I submitted a opinion piece which was correct. It was about polio eradication. No, no, sorry. It was about COVID, right? Um, and I have no idea what kind of review it got, you know, whether they send it out to scientists and so forth. I, I suspect not. But uh, it seems that you could publish anything. This is science fiction, really. I think we just proved that with that op-ed. I've, I've written a couple op-eds for the New York Times, and I think it just goes to their editorial staff, who reads yeah. probably none of whom are basic scientists. And unfortunately, the New York Times has a broad reach, and many people will read it and be convinced because they can't be critical. They don't know the science well enough to be critical. And this is 
this is not politics. This is not economics where most people may be able to understand the issues. This is a specialized area where you need to have some training to really understand it. Right. And the reason it becomes convincing, because after that op-ed came out in the New York Times, I had a number of people call me or email me and say, see, see, I told you it was the lab leak. <laughs> it's so detailed that, that unless you really are familiar with this particular subject, you're not going to be able to refute that. It all seems true. Sure. Right? Such an overwhelming amount of facts that, as we now know, are incorrect facts. But you can see how people are convinced. Well, we will put links to this article in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Vincent. 